from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor at large of the journal. If you're not already a subscriber to the Free Expression podcast, please do sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever it is that you do your listening. This week, is higher education a threat to America? After last week's congressional hearing featuring the presidents of three of the nation's most prestigious universities, at least that's how they like to think of themselves, we're left wondering just how bad is the ideological extremism and intolerance on campus? At the weekend, Elizabeth McGill, president of the University of Pennsylvania, resigned along with the university's board chair after she was unable to tell a member of Congress whether calls for the genocide of Jewish people would be in breach of the university's speech rules. Claudine Gay, president of Harvard University, was similarly reticent to say that threatening a Jewish genocide amounted to intimidation. But Harvard's board, interestingly, stood by her this week. Sally Kornbluth, the president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is also still in place despite her performance at the hearing too. Now, the three presidents' defence of this virulently anti-Semitic form of free speech came as something of a surprise to those who've paid attention to what's been going on at universities and colleges. In the last few years, academics, public figures, researchers and even students have been denied platforms and teaching positions and even places at these universities because their views don't conform to the prevailing left-wing orthodoxies. So what have we actually learned after these remarkable events about the state of our colleges? Well, my guest this week is John Ellis. He's Professor Emeritus of German Literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and author of The Breakdown of Higher Education, How It Happened, The Damage It Does, and What Can Be Done. He wrote an op-ed in the journal last week that said, among other things, and I quote, the biggest threat to our future isn't climate change, China, or the national debt. It's the tyrannical grip that a hopelessly corrupt higher education now has on our national life. If we don't stop it now, it will eventually destroy the most successful society in world history. And John Ellis is with me now. Professor Ellis, thank you very much for joining Free Expression. Thank you for having me. So we've seen some pretty extraordinary things in the last week or two, maybe not so extraordinary to those who are familiar with the state of higher education. What have you made as you've watched the, you know, the congressional testimony last week from the three university presidents, then the resignation of the president of the University of Pennsylvania, the Harvard board standing by its president, Claudine Gay. As you've watched all this, you, you're a veteran of these battles, should we say, in higher education. What's your reaction? Well, first of all, I mean, the, the initial impression you have, of course, of three women doing very, very badly. But after just a couple more seconds, what begins to occur to you is that the real problem is how did those three get into those positions? I mean, what kind of corruption in those institutions led them to a point such obviously uh, incapable people? They're, I mean, they've extremely poor at their jobs. And they've obviously been shoved in as diversity hires. But if you think about all that has to happen for someone like Claudine Gay to get into office, there has to be a search committee. Uh, that search committee is obviously was obviously loaded with political radicals. But someone set that search committee up, so some other body had to be extremely uh, dominated by political radicalism. When the search committee results came in, they had to go to the Harvard Board of Overseers. So again, there had to be a tremendous majority in that body too for this kind of nonsense. So, I mean, your first impression is, is the three not doing very well. Is second thoughts, though, it's, it spells out a level of corruption in those institutions that could have allowed this to happen. Yeah, and it, it's interesting, isn't it, the differential responses from UPenn and Harvard. We've seen Liz McGill fired or resigned, I should say, but and, and indeed the chair of the board resigning too, presumably resigning under pressure. But the Harvard board standing firmly behind Claudine Gay, purely as an observer. What do you think explains the difference between those two boards' responses? Well, the Penn board... I mean, was having trouble with Liz McGill for several weeks beforehand, so that this congressional testimony came as the final blow to her. The Harvard situation, the way I read that, is that the radicals are telling us that they schemed and connived for years to get uh, someone like that into the presidency of Harvard. They're not about to give up on that now. They've worked too hard for it. Mm. That, I think, is what's going on. They will not give up the progress they've made in promoting political radicalism. And she, of course, has been accused 
Well, some, you know, depending on your view, but reasonably credibly of plagiarism this week. We've seen various accusations. I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's your view of that? Uh, and again, it, the Harvard board, again, just, just dismissed it. You know, you've been pretty clear about how you think she got the job. But if that is to be added to the list of um, questions about her, it's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? That, the, as you say, and pretty shows how entrenched the commitment to this ideology must be at these universities, that they would keep her in spite of all of these things. Well, I think the problem they've come up against is this, that to identify a case of plagiarism, you've got to have someone who knows the original. And the person who knows the original is likely to be the author. So that what happened, I think, is that three or four authors noticed the plagiarism. And the Harvard board said, well, okay, we can live with that. But that alerted other authors to go looking. So now you have many, many cases. I mean, I I forget how many, but it's at least a dozen, I think, of authors who've noticed the plagiarism. That possibly got a lot worse after Harvard made its decision. The one that I'm most impressed by is Carol Swaim, who says that not only are individual paragraphs lifted from her work, but that basically the whole framework of ideas, her ideas were lifted too, so that there's not a great deal left in the Claudine Gay article that is really original. So I don't know whether there'll be a second round to this. I mean, if the Harvard overseers meet and someone says, well, we made our decision on the basis of three or four paragraphs, but actually what's come in as more authors were motivated to look harder, what's come in now is much, much more than that. It's possible they may think again. I doubt it, though, because I think that you have to remember from the point of view of political radicals, this is an extraordinary achievement. They have a black woman who is a very, very woke radical heading the institution. They won't want to give that up. It'll take a great deal to to produce a result like that. Yeah, and their reluctance to give that up shows us just how deeply entrenched. Do you think the controversy in the last week, and again, the reactions that we've seen from donors, from alumni, from some, not many, to be fair, of the faculty, I guess they have uh, they have more at stake, as it were, of these universities. Does this give you any hope at all that this could mark some kind of a turning of the tide here, that congressional testimony and what we've seen since uh, in the last week has opened a lot of eyes to the kind of thing you've been talking and writing about for years, just how intellectually and morally corrupt our universities have become. Is this a turning point or do you think this just goes on as the same as ever? No, I think there has been a shift. I don't don't think there'll be a shift on the campuses. The campuses are thoroughly corrupt and nothing you or I can say or do will change that. It will take force from the outside. But in the public, I do see a shift. I've got liberal uh, family members who are the same telling me that this time they agree with me. I'm seeing more and more evidence. Farid Sakaria, I mm-hmm. think the other day, came out and said that the universities need to stop their misadventure into politics. Now, you can't get more solidly liberal than he. There are proliferating cases of this, of, of solid, old-fashioned liberals who've decided to speak up. Up to now, one of the things that's protected the university radicals is that anyone on the left is terribly reluctant to side with conservatives against anyone on the left. There seems to be a little bit of a change in that now, I think. A lot of of middle-of-the-road liberals are beginning to speak differently. Now, how much of a force this change is, we're not going to know that for a while. It may be relatively minor, or it may be enough to really make a difference. So let's go back and look at just, just um, for how bad things are and how we got here. So on the question of how bad things are, you taught for a long time in higher education. You're a professor emeritus at the University of California. So this gives a bit of an insight because, you know, you do have these conversations with people. We're all familiar with the data now that show, you know, overwhelming majorities of the faculty, I'm a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of the faculty, let me flip it around, are concerned. Conservative, the vast overwhelming majority, the fact is, of almost all of these major universities are liberal, progressive to far left. We've heard all these stories about cancellations and people being cancelled, people being prevented from speaking on campus, people being cancelled, their research being suppressed or denied, and most importantly, perhaps people seeking positions tenured and other positions at universities being denied unless described to these views. Give us a sense, if you would, from your own experience, and I know, again, you're no longer actively teaching, but your own experience. How bad is it? How restrictive of genuinely free 
thought and free expression is the environment at these big universities? Very bad indeed. It couldn't be worse. I mean, anyone who now speaks up and is identified as conservative in the views that he states will be targeted very quickly. But I think I would call this the cancellation phase of what's been happening. I think that's the last five or six years. I think if you look at the phases of this, it reminds me of the story of the man who went bankrupt and someone said to him, well, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, well, gradually and then suddenly. Yes, the old Hemingway quote. The, the gradual <laughs> phase was, uh, I think, 1970 to 2000. That was the time when the faculty, which was divided three left to right in 1970, the faculty by 30 years later had become five to one left to right. Now, that was the gradual phase. The sudden phase came after 2000 because at that point, with five to one, the left was in control of all the levels of power and the slide downhill went very fast indeed at that point. That was the suddenly part. And one thing that was very noticeable was that prior to 2000, you had very large majorities of left to right in humanities departments like politics, English literature, history. But the sciences were still fairly split between left and right. Now, after 2000, virtually all recruitments, with almost without exception, were left. And that included the sciences. That's something that people don't easily grasp. Yeah, that is interesting. One tends to think that that is it's heavily concentrated in the humanities and the arts. But you're saying that's, yeah. that has changed in the last 20 years, is it? That's where the suddenly phase comes in. The gradually phase was all to do with the humanities and social sciences. After 2000, with the left faculty thoroughly in charge, they then have sufficient control to make sure that no appointments are made. And the way you could tell this is very simple. A survey in 2000 found five to one left to right. A survey six or seven years later found eight to one. Now, if you think about the mathematics, I know it's hard to do it very quickly, but to go from five to one campus wide to eight to one, Believe me, the mathematics tells you that every single appointment that was made in those five, six years was left. Therefore, it follows that the sciences by that time were also completely under leftist control. After 2005, you had another 10 years, I think, up to 2015, during which the solidification was growing so by about that time, the ratio of left to right was around 12 to 1, maybe more. I think it depends on what survey you look at and which particular institutions were involved in the survey. But at that point, I think we begin the cancellation phase. And the cancellation phase happens because the radicals are now so overwhelming in numbers that they can do whatever they like. And they begin at that point to attack conservatives openly and very strongly. And so we've seen prominent conservatives, uh, let's say John Eastman is a good example, a, Claremont, a right. professor, yeah. professor of law yeah. Chapman, yeah. openly attacked by his colleagues and harassed into retirement. Now, I should also say he's, isn't he's, he's also being prosecuted by the special counsel over his advice to Donald Trump. Yeah. That's right. I don't want to mention too many names because they're friends of mine and I've, I don't want to embarrass them, but I know personally, just in California, half a dozen very prominent conservatives who are being harassed into early retirement. In fact, pretty well all of them have in fact gone along and they have decided they've had enough. So that's what I call the cancellation phase. It's been going on for the last six, seven years, I think. You have pretty much now an environment on campus that is completely of one mind with anyone who's not of that mind shutting their mouth because they really don't want to attract the wrath of the rest. What role does the explosive growth of the administrators and the administrations in these universities play? We, we've seen some extraordinary figures that I think the number of administrators to faculty has dramatically changed in the last 30, 40 years in favor of administrators. And of course, a lot of these are these so-called diversity, equity and inclusion 
types who then impose all kinds of rules on hiring, on university admissions, on the way in which the universities operate. How big has that been in this process, do you think? It's been a major factor. As you say, the number of administrators, I think last time I looked, it was something like one administrator to one faculty member. Uh, Go back to my early days, and uh, that was more like, oh, I don't know, it wasn't a quarter of that. When I was a dean back in the dark ages in 1970 or so, I certainly didn't have staff that uh, rivaled the faculty numbers. You're right to point to the DEI. The DEI numbers have absolutely exploded. I think I quoted in my uh, WSJ piece last week the fact that the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education membership has tripled in the last three years. Uh, Tripling is a fantastic number. I mean, when I think about how if I had put in a request to the administration to have my budget when I was a dean tripled, with my staff tripled, they they would have just laughed at me. But uh, all these people have nothing really to do. I mean, they don't engage in the academic business of the university. They don't do teaching. They don't do research. They don't supervise teaching or research. All they're there to do is to sit and find ways to make trouble and to stir up racial strife. The more systemic racism they can find on campus, the more reason there is for their existence. So you have this sort of strange incentives, which is a textbook case of perversive incentives. The more trouble they can find, the more their existence is justified. And that is a a toxic situation for a campus. You've described, I think I should say very well, how this happened. That is, as you put it, gradually and then suddenly. Can you explain why it's happened? Again, I think we always, I mean, I'm of a certain age, wasn't educated in this country, I was educated in England, but, you know, there was a similar kind of sort of leftward tilt to campuses in the 1970s, 60s, 70s and 80s, I think. But it was a leftward tilt. It wasn't an overbalanced leftward bias. But how did it come about that we went from that position, where, as you say, there were a portion of faculty that were conservative or certainly not left wing, was quite high. How did these institutions get captured in this way? Well, you're right to use the word capture. I mean, I, uh, the one thing I'd like everyone who's listening to understand is that our entire educational system has been captured by a radical sect that means no good to the country, that is very destructive. But no, how it happened, well, I think one of the the founding events was a group of Marxists in the 60s met, Students for a Democratic Society, there was 200 of them, and they decided that they would never, ever get, get any success at the ballot box. They'd never be elected to anything. And they, in their little report they wrote, they decided that the way forward for them, the way to get power was not by the ballot box, but by taking over higher education. Now, I was there, I started academic teaching in 59 as a faculty member at the University of Wales. So when I heard about this, this, uh, the Port Huron Statement, as it was called, I laughed because I thought this little bunch of uh, malcontents would never get anywhere with such a plan. But they did. They did get somewhere. They had one dramatic piece of help that no one could have foreseen, I think, and that is if you look at the years 1965, 1975, those were the crucial years. Now, in those years... The American public higher education exploded in size. I mean, the, the baby boomers were coming of age for college about 20 years after the Second World War when the soldiers came home and had lots of children which to, to make up for the family life they'd missed during the war. So 65, there's a sudden need for a lot of new colleges. Between 65 and 75... American public higher education went from 3.9 million students to 8 million students. That's a doubling in 10 years. That's an enormous rise. In, in retrospect, that was a mistake to allow something that big to happen so quickly because it happening that fast, it couldn't be well, you know, well thought through. It, could, it couldn't be done with deliberateness and maximal intelligence. So what we had was... The size of the faculty had to double 
slightly more than double, actually, in 10 years. And so you had to find an enormous amount of new assistant professors. But there was something else about the years 65 to 75. That was the years of the trouble over the Vietnam War on American campuses. So in those 10 years... Graduate students especially were radicalized. I mean, everyone hated the uh, the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. Everyone thought he was lying about the war. So the, the whole atmosphere on campus was students, not faculty, I think. Faculty was still, in fact, the same moderately conservative centrist faculty that it was been. But the graduate students were thoroughly radicalized in those 10 years. And those were the people that, that from whom... One had to recruit this massive increase in the number of professors. So what happened was that instead of taking on, you know, one or two at a time who were radicalized, who could have been gradually adjusting to the mores of the profession, gradually adjusting to what it meant to be a professor, instead of that, we got a massive invasion, just like you know, today, people pouring across the border. People poured into the faculty common rooms, and they didn't share the ethos of the faculty. They were full of a burning desire to change society. Most of them were Marxists. And so instead of adjusting to the ethos of academic life, there were enough of them that they could bring their own ethos to the campuses, and they became a permanent obstacle to the continuation of the academy as we've known it. And slowly, those people, as they got more and more senior, they took over. I think it was a stroke of enormous bad luck that the years 65 to 75 had these two different things, you know, the enormous expansion of academia and the radicalization of graduate students. Uh, without those two right. being together, we, we would never have had this problem. That was the catalyst. Okay, we're going to take a break there. But when we come back, I'll have more with Professor John Ellis talking about the intellectual moral corruption of our universities and what can be done to reverse it. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Professor John Ellis, and we're talking about the state of free speech, ideological extremism, and intolerance at our universities. So what is to be done, to quote Lenin? You said in your Wall Street Journal op-ed last week, we must take back control of higher education from cultural vandals who've learned nothing from the disastrous history of societies that have implemented their ideas. And then you give some ideas. So tell us what you think you already say in that piece, and we've already discussed this a little bit. It's certainly not going to be enough to fire one or two university presidents, you know, to encourage the others, as it were. I mean, the scale of this thing is so vast. Yes. Um, you know, the reach of these people at every level in these universities, large and small is so extensive. How on earth do we start to roll it back? Well, you're, you're right. One of the things that's most striking about this is that it has affected almost every institution in the same way. I mean, I can count on the fingers of one hand the institution it hasn't affected. So wherever you go, you see pretty much the same values in the faculty. Well, I think there are two factors, two ways of going that I suggested, and they're quite different in method and scope. One is state universities. I mean, state legislatures are in control of the budgets for state universities. And where you have red states with a conservative majority, they are in a position to simply replace the president of their state universities and tell that president that his or her job is to stop this nonsense and to use the power of the purse and use the power of hiring and firing to redirect the faculty towards genuine academic work, real education, instead of political indoctrination. This, to some extent, is what's going on in Florida right now. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Florida's the one who's, uh, that is leading. There's something going on in Texas, North Carolina, not as much. But take, for example, a state like Idaho. Idaho has a comfortable conservative majority. It has done virtually nothing, in spite of being prodded by a great friend of mine who is uh, in one of the uh, Idaho campuses. This friend of mine regularly prods them and gets nowhere. There is a great deal of complacency. There's a great deal of uh, comfortableness. 
there was a great deal of disbelief. People who uh, had a wonderful time, says undergraduates at Harvard or Princeton, cannot bring themselves to believe that the deterioration is so great. Now, that's where I think this recent episode with those three women testifying might have shifted things. I'm hopeful. As we speak, a copy of my WSJ editorial last week is in the hands of every legislator in Idaho and in Florida. Oh, good. And we're trying to make sure that the case across the country and that people in the National Association of Scholars are pressing to have a movement on this. There's one place where an official of the National Association of Scholars will not do that, and that's California, because that official is me. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's pointless to even try in California. But elsewhere, I'm hopeful there's a movement there, because you really do have the possibility for state legislatures to say to you know, essentially that there are professors who are using the classroom to advance their political ideology. They're not educating. They must be removed because they are hired to do one job, but they're not doing that job. Therefore, they should go. They should not be paid for doing a job they were not hired to do. But the second thing I mentioned is that, and I think this is the only real solution, is for the public to grasp the depth of the problem, which it has not up to this point. But again, because as I was saying, too many people have fond memories of the undergraduate years and simply can't believe this could have happened. So the public can finally grasp the depth of the problem, change their behavior, stop sending their children to these pseudo-universities that don't educate them, in fact, miseducate them, and fill them full of ideas that are complete nonsense in the modern world. If that can happen, if the public can change their attitude, then they'll stop sending kids to colleges. A lot of colleges will fold, and that will create nice premises for decent places to be rebuilt from scratch. And that's the sort of thing that is going on in the University of Austin. They're not using an old campus, but they are building stuff from scratch. New College in Florida is uh, likewise. They're thoroughly uh, addressing this problem of a complete overhaul of the faculty. That's where I think this latest episode of the three women being interviewed in Congress I do see a shift of public opinion. I am very, very hopeful that this is, in fact, the start of that movement. Until the public says, we don't want this nonsense anymore. Well, that's, I was going to say, Professor, that's part of the problem, isn't it? In that these universities, for all their intellectual corruption and the, the direction that they've taken in the last 30, 40 years, still have incredible prestige brand value, don't mm -hmm. they? I mean, yeah. and, you know, I know yeah. I've got so many yeah. conservative friends of mine, you know, who are disgusted at what's going on, but they still want their kids to go to Harvard and Stanford and Yale and MIT because, well, they're the prestige universities in the country. And, and by the way, these universities have continued till obviously until very recently taking huge, huge donations, huge philanthropy from alumni and others, and, and indeed including those who want their children to get into these places. Is that going to change, do you think? Because it misaligns incentives, doesn't it? When even people like conservatives are more than happy to, delighted for their children to go there, more than happy to keep sending these universities tuition and donations and everything else, it doesn't act as any kind of an incentive for them to stop doing what they're doing. Absolutely. No, that, as you say, the problem is a lag in attitudes. I mean, people cannot bring themselves to give up. And, and it is a magical name. I mean, Harvard is a magical name. You know, the, the public is still in awe. It's like a sort of spell that is cast over the public. Uh, they rightly think that if their kids can get into Harvard, that itself, quite apart from any education they don't receive, uh, that itself is a distinction that their kid will benefit from and so on. But as I say, very slowly, this knowledge has got to trickle down to the average member of the public that this is a tremendous expenditure of money and four years of their kid's life that is not doing any good. In fact, it's helping to drag the country down. Finally, Professor, so how optimistic can we be? Again, you know, this has been an important moment the last week or so and something we've talked about the, a little bit, uh, the, the fact that so many alumni and 
donors are pulling their donations from these big colleges. We are seeing things like University of Austin being set up and as a kind of an alternative, a free speech-based university. So, I mean, again, we're definitely seeing a growing public awareness and a growing movement, I think, to roll back this tie. But how likely do you think it is in a 10 or 20-year time frame that we can achieve these changes, do you think? Oh, I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> um, Look, all I can say is that uh, the last couple of weeks have been encouraging. I mean, Harvard's insisting on keeping Claudine Gay has sent a message to the public that the corruption in Harvard is so deep that even an obviously unfit person is being kept in the presidency. That action by the, the overseers of Harvard has done more to help the cause of reform than anything else they could have done. Look, I'm going to be optimistic and say that I think the public has been slowly moving in this direction. And uh, they've just had a lot of help from those three women and the Congress. And I'm sure that uh, there'll be other instances like this because, look, the world of the campus is such a strange world. And um, it's getting stranger. I mean, you know, when you set foot on campus, you are in a different universe. You are in a place that is dominated. It, it's not like a normal place where there's a normal cross-section of people. There are no conservatives. There are almost no centrists. The place is dominated by an extreme left-wing sect. Any visitor to the campus is bound to be struck by the fact that this is an unreal world. It's not the real world. You find, for example, that in the, the population at large, I think there's quite a bit of knowledge of the Second World War and of Hitler and of Stalin. On the campuses, these things are not talked about. You won't find them in the history curriculum. College kids don't know anything about the great events of the 20th century, these monumental ideologies that had to be dismantled by the democracies, that wonderful story of the Second World War, which is, let's face it, is the Trojan War of, of the modern era. It is the greatest war and conflagration in the conflict of our, our modern age. Eventually, it's bound to occur to the public more and more that this world of the college campus is utter nonsense from start to finish. Professor John Ellis, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I should say the book you wrote on this is called The Breakdown of Higher Education, How It Happened, The Damage It Does, and What Can Be Done, which seems to me to summarize admirably the challenge and the thinking that I think so many people have as they see what's going on in higher education. John Ellis, thank you so much for joining Free Expression. Well, thank you again for having me. Well, that's it for this week. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you very much in the meantime for joining Free Expression and have a great week and we'll speak to you then. Music.